So today I'd like to start on chapter 19. So we'll be getting into some new material and talking about the chemistry of carboxylic acids and nitriles. And for those of you working off of the fifth edition rather than the sixth edition, you'll see that the textbook moved this chapter around. And I think that's in part because the topics that we're going to get introduced to today are a little bit different than some other aspects of carbonyl chemistry. And I think the, the textbooks had a little problem placing this chapter. I think one of the other things we're going to see is that we'll see various aspects that are similar between carboxylic acids, esters, that whole family, even nitriles and ketones, so specifically in ketones and aldehydes, specifically some of the reactivity of the carbonyl group, and then some of the differences. But in at least today's lecture, I want to focus on some other properties of carboxylic acids, uh, in particular in terms of at least their chemical properties, their acidity, and bring in ideas of inductive effects and resonance, basically stabilization of charges which is a big theme, you know, both in carbonyl chemistry and in all of organic chemistry. So carboxylic acids are ubiquitous compounds. You know, last night I had a salad. I had salad dressing. The salad dressing contains vinegar, which is which uh, contains acetic acid, right? So that's a very common compound. It comes from uh, bacterial action upon ethanol, which in turn comes from yeast action upon the glucose that's in the grapes that make up wine. This morning, I had some orange juice for breakfast. And of course, the orange juice has a tart flavor, just like the vinegar in my salad dressing. In fact, although I don't recommend your tasting laboratory chemicals, although it used to be a common practice in describing compounds, but a common feature of carboxylic acids is a tart or acidic flavor. And this molecule here is what gave my orange juice a tart flavor, it's citric acid. Obviously, for those of you in biochemistry, this is also a very important compound in the citric acid cycle. And as I, as I said, this is a common feature of all different citrus fruits, oranges, lemons, limes, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, all of the bounty we get here. Your textbook also reminds us that carboxylic acids are a common feature of amino acids. I'll just draw out one. My laboratory spends a lot of time working with amino acids because our research focuses on the chemistry and biology of peptides. This amino acid here, the simplest chiral amino acid, is alanine. So it's an example of an amino acid. So when I started by introducing sort of the whole broad carbonyl family, broadly defined, I also said that cousins include nitriles. The nitrile group, the CN group, is in the same oxidation state as the carboxylic acid group. It's in the plus three oxidation state. And so just as I've shown you uh, some common carboxylic acids that you've probably encountered in your day-to-day -day life, I'll show you a common nitrile that you've probably encountered. In fact, you may be encountering right now. This is, this is called acrylonitrile. That's, these are all common names. We'll get into systematic names in a, in a moment. But for example, the systematic name of acetic acid is ethanoic acid. I'll put that in parentheses because nobody would call it that. 
the common name of acrylonitrile is propene nitrile. All right, well, that's the, the nitrile, but I haven't come into why you might encounter it. Somebody, where would you encounter this molecule? Where would you encounter acrylonitrile? Where have you heard the term nitrile? Yes. Gloves, yes. This molecule is a monomer. It is a building block that makes up polymers. So it makes up plastics, gloves. One of the common plastics is called ABN. For those of you who've done 3D printing, it's one of the common printing elements there. It's also going to be in various polymers. And although we won't spend a lot of time talking about polymers in the class, when you go ahead and you link the molecules together by a free radical or anionic reaction, you get a long chain like so. I'll just draw some squiggly lines here where one molecule is linking to the next, is linking to the next. So chances are between the plastic that you have on maybe or have in your possession right now in this classroom and perhaps even the fabric that you're sitting on, chances are there is, or the, the plastic of the chairs, chances are there is some acrylonitrile based polymer. Often it's co-polymerized with another monomer building block. All right. The common feature, and again, the reason I say we're going to see all the chemical relationships between the nitrile group and the carboxylic acid group, and for that matter, we already mentioned esters, amides, acid chlorides. And again, the reason I say they're in the same family is the same oxidation state. Okay, a common feature of all of the carboxylic acids that we are encountering is the carboxy group. I'm going to draw in the lone pairs of electrons, and I'll just draw in an R group to indicate that typically you would have some sort of alcohol or aromatic group. So this is the carboxy group. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the carboxyl group. but I think carboxy is preferred. We write a lot of structures in shorthand and interchangeably, which at least initially to people seeing things can be confusing because just like I'll use words like dog or dachshund or puppy all together, we'll write the molecule in various ways. So I could write this as RCOOH, RCO2H, and it's all saying different things in the same way. When you see RCO, the first thing you think is, oh, there's going to be another atom attached to the O. In other words, it's going to be R and then a carbon and then an oxygen bound to another oxygen, but of course, no. But, and again, all of these fall into this broad class of carbonyl compounds. And a common feature of the carbonyl group is that it's sp2 hybridized. In other words, that carbon that makes up the central carbon is flat trigonal, the three substituents on it, the R group, the oxygen of the OH group, and the oxygen with the double bond all lie in the same plane. That oxygen in turn also has a double bond to it and is sp2 hybridized, at least you can think of it that way. And of course we think of it as having 
a sigma bond to that carbonyl oxygen and a pi bond. And that's what's going to give a lot of reactivity we've seen in the carbonyl group. We're also going to see when we talk about the acidity of the carbonyl group that it gives us resonance. So as I said, the nitrile group is sort of a cousin in the sense they're in the same family. You have the same oxidation state. This carbon is in the plus three oxidation state. And the nitrile carbon is also in the plus three oxidation state. Carbon of the nitrile group is, and I'll just write this as a nitrile group to remind us, just as I did for the carboxy group. Sometimes you'll also see it referred to as the cyano group. Part of this has to do with whether the group is taking the highest priority in the molecule in the nomenclature of the molecule. And again, part of it is interchangeable usage. Here, the carbon and for that matter, the nitrogen are SP hybridized. That means we have one sigma bond to the carbon between the carbon and the nitrogen and two pi, pi bonds. And the R to carbon to nitrogen bond angle is 180 degrees. In the case of the carboxy group, it's 120 for the oxygen, carbon, oxygen, and for the R carbon, oxygen bond angles. Questions or thoughts at this point? All right, so let's move on to talking about how we name these compounds. So the systematic nomenclature is that we're going to name a molecule as the alkanoic acid. So I'll sort of put it as like this, but I guess, I think by example, it makes more sense. So, and for the nitriles, for that matter, we'll name them as the alkan plus, uh, well, technically they'll be together. So we don't double oops, the N. So we'll name it as the alkan nitrile, but I think it'll make more, more sense in a moment if we go ahead and look at the nomenclature. So in other words, this molecule here with a six carbon chain, we look at, we say it's from hexane, so it's hexanoic acid. Carboxylic acids get the highest priority in nomenclature. So if you have two chains, it's always going to be the chain containing the carboxylic acid and the longer chain that dictates it. If you have another group in the molecule, that's going to take a secondary place in the nomenclature and in the numbering for that matter. So the carboxylic acid would be the one position. So this molecule would be 4-hydroxybutanoic acid. And so on the nitriles, very similar. Again, I think by example, things make a lot of sense. This molecule here is 3-chlorobutane nitrile. And although I haven't specified in my drawing, there is a stereocenter at the three position. So if I was talking about the compound with the stereochemistry unspecified and wasn't paying attention, I'd just call it 3-chlorobutane nitrile. 
But if I was specifying one stereoisomer, I'd say R3-chlorobutane nitrile or S3-chlorobutane nitrile. And I think in terms of organic chemistry, the fact that we often have these embedded levels of structure and meaning in the molecules is something that maybe initially is hard because you look at this, you say, oh, there's no stereocenter, but of course, no matter what, that carbon is tetrahedral, that chlorine is either pointing out toward us, or pointing back, or in some molecules it's pointing out, and in some pointing back. As I said, if we have a carboxylic acid and a nitrile group, the nitrile group is secondary in the nomenclature. And so this molecule here would be P, cyanobenzoic acid. I'll just take a couple of other examples here. I think they're fun molecules. So if you have two carboxylic acid in two carboxylic acids in the molecule then you would name it as a dioic acid so this would be hexane dioic acid and although you don't realize it this molecule also should be familiar to you in day-to-day -day life, even if you've never seen it drawn before and you don't know what I'm talking about. But again, I'm going to toss this out. Who has an idea why they may be encountering this molecule right now? Who's got a backpack? Why did I just ask that question? Nylon, yep, this is a building block of nylon. It's a common compound. Often you have common names, just as we saw acetic acid's a common name. It's called adipic acid but this is a molecule that makes up many forms of nylon. Most forms of nylon are made, many forms of nylon are made by connecting diacids to diamines by amide linkages. So you'll have a diacid with an amide linkage to a diamine linked to another diacid molecule by an amide linkage to a diamine to make a long molecule, a polymer, just as we saw in the case of the polyacrylonitrile polymer I showed you. And these long chains make strong structures. Nylon was inspired, in fact, by silk. It was a synthetic molecule created during World War II as a replacement or at about that time for silk, which is a natural molecule, and silk also has amide linkages in it, but silk is made up of amino acids, among them alanine and glycine, another amino acid, whereas nylon is a synthetic molecule that makes it up. I'll show you one more piece of nomenclature and again, I'm trying to choose molecules that I think are relevant or didactic. This is a molecule that's called 3-oxobutanoic acid. And I think what we illustrate here is the fact that the carboxylic acid takes priority and that then when you have a ketone group, we don't name this as a derivative of butanone, the oxygen takes a second priority. 
So as I said, many molecules have common names. I wrote the name adipic acid, or I'm writing the name adipic acid over here. I'll put it in parentheses. This molecule is called acetoacetic acid. And it's going to come back to us as the ethyl ester when we learn about the acetoacetic ester synthesis, a very powerful set of reactions for building up methyl ketones, very versatile way to synthesize methyl ketones. All right, well, we don't really know molecules just as black and white, blue and white structures on paper or on screens. We really know them as things that you can touch in the laboratory, or in some cases, as I said, on your in your glass of orange juice or on your salad. Acetic acid is about five, uh, vinegar rather, is about 5% acetic acid. You wouldn't want to use concentrated acetic acid, but if you use white vinegar, it's just a solution that's been diluted. In fact, it may even not come from fermentation but come from petroleum. Pure acetic acid is a liquid. It's got a boiling point of 118. That's pretty high for, of course, that's Celsius. I'll write in C, but if I'm not indicating otherwise, I would mean Celsius. That's pretty high for a molecule of this size with just four atoms other than hydrogen in it. In fact, if you compare and look at many molecules, you're gonna see much lower boiling points. I hope you don't smoke, but if you do smoke and you use a cigarette lighter, your cigarette lighter contains butane, which is a gas, and that gas boils at zero degrees Celsius, that's, of course, at uh, atmospheric pressure. And if you've held a cigarette lighter, even if you don't smoke, you'll see there's liquid in it. When you apply pressure, the butane liquefies. So the pressure in your cigarette lighter is just about one atmosphere to liquefy the butane, about 15 PSI, not even the pressure of your bicycle tube. But that's what many small molecules with only four carbons have in terms of their boiling point. The big difference is the types of non-covalent forces. So butane has only really van der Waals forces. I'll just write it as VDW forces making the molecules stick together. In other words, you have these sort of transient dipole, transient dipole interactions. You don't even have a net molecular dipole. Whereas acetic acid has not only van der Waals interactions, but also it has dipole-dipole interactions. and you have hydrogen bonding, you have an OH group that's bound uh, to a, or an oxygen, a hydrogen that's bound to a very electronegative atom to an oxygen. Hydrogen's bound to oxygen or to some extent nitrogen participate in hydrogen bonding. And so to give you a feeling for the importance of these various forces, we can just sort of add them in piecewise with keeping the molecules about the same size, about three non-hydrogen atoms. So if I add in a carbonyl group to make propionaldehyde or pro, I guess I'll stick to the, the IAPAC name, propanal, you get a liquid that has a boiling point of 48 degrees. And so if you look at that, you'd say, okay, 
well, now we still have Van der Waals interactions. We also have dipole-dipole interactions, right? That carbonyl has a dipole. But we don't have hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen bonding buys us a lot in terms of interactions. If we go ahead and look at propanol, you'll see a significantly higher boiling point, a boiling point of 97 degrees. And of course, now you get Van der Waals dipole dipole. and hydrogen bonding. Interactions. Carboxylic acids are special, though, you know, because you look, you say, well, wait a second. OK, we had one OH group in propanol. It boils at 97. We have one OH group in uh, in acetic acid, it boils at 118. What's so special about carboxylic acids? Carboxylic acids are special in that they can form hydrogen bonded dimers. In other words, two molecules fit together nicely to make a pair. And so that makes the hydrogen bonding more strong. These form transiently. They're not something that you would isolate, but they would form. And if you distilled the acetic acid, the molecules would break up from each other, but they would form transiently. And you can see this in various aspects of the spectroscopy of the molecule, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Just to give you a, a feeling, a general rule of thumb is that molecules with about up to about four carbons per oxygen are soluble in water. So butane doesn't dissolve in water. There's no oxygen, but propionaldehyde or propanal does dissolve in water, propanol does dissolve in water, acetic acid dissolves in water, in fact is miscible with water. Just one more comparison here to give you an idea. If we take another molecule that has four, uh, has four non-hydrogen atoms, if we take propanitriol, it also is a liquid. I should write liquid over here for propanol. I forgot to. We should all, it is also a liquid and it's got a boiling point of 90, oops, 97 degrees. And you look at that and that kind of tells you something. It tells you a little bit about the size of the molecular dipole, right? Both neither propanitriol nor acid aldehyde can hydrogen bond to each other. So you'll have both, you have, I'm sorry, can hydrogen bond. So you only have Van der Waals and dipole-dipole interactions. But that molecular dipole for the nitrile group is really big. In fact, we use the molecule acetonitrile, the two carbon nitrile, ethane nitrile, as a solvent for chromatography, for what's called reverse phase chromatography, because it is both miscible with water and polar, but less so than water. Okay, this is a good point to stop and take questions. Any thoughts about the physical properties of carboxylic acids or nitriles? All right, let's talk a little bit about spectroscopy. So carboxylic acids, and I've given you in the assignments, I've given you a number of spectroscopy problems. Carboxylic acids 
really stand out in the IR spectrum. They've got a broad OH stretch. In part, it's broad because of the hydrogen bonding. The interactions that occur. If you're just writing it out, you'd probably see a band that sort of goes from 2,500 to 3,500 wave numbers. If you were looking at the spectrum, you'd maybe focus on the fact that it's big, broad, and ugly. Really can't miss it. You would also see if you looked at the spectrum or if you tabulated the spectrum, a carbonyl group somewhere in the range of 1700 to 1725. And those numbers are a little bit loose in the sense if you have conjugation, you can go lower, say, to 1680. But collectively, these two features of the IR spectrum, the OH stretch and the carbonyl stretch, are pretty good giveaway if you've got a simple compound, it's a carboxylic acid. In the NMR spectrum, the OH group is interesting. For your purposes, I will say that you will see it and it will typically be at about 10 to 13 ppm. Your textbook lists 10 to 12, 10 to 13 is more realistic, but it doesn't really, really matter. In practice, if you're actually running a spectrum, because it's broad, which in part deals with, relates to hydrogen bonding and in part deals with chemical exchange with water that's often present in your solvent, it may actually be very hard to see the OH stretch. But for your purposes, I think you'll always, you know, at least at this purpose, you'll always see it. So hydrogens that are next to the carbonyl group get shifted downfield. Your textbook lists two to 2.5 parts per million. So remember a normal hydrogen, just a plain old hydrogen of an alkyl group might be about 0.9 to 1.4 ppm, maybe 1.9 if it's a tertiary hydrogen. Here you could say two to 2.5, or I usually use two to three ppm. That carbonyl group is electron withdrawing that pulls electron density away from the CH group and therefore shifts it downfield. It's what you would call de-shielding. And that's something we'll see it just at a, a moment when we talk about carboxyl groups and the inductive effect. In the C13 NMR, all of the carbonyl groups show way downfield about 170 to 220 ppm broadly defined with carboxylic acids, <clears throat> for that matter, esters generally showing up at about 170 to 180 ppm. The nitrile group also shows effects that are sort of unusual because of the carbon nitrogen triple bond. The IR spectrum, because that carbon nitrogen bond is a triple bond, it occurs at much shorter frequency or much higher uh, wave numbers than a carbonyl group, even though it's got two atoms of about the same size. So it's about 2250 wave numbers. If you're looking at spectrum, an IR spectrum of a nitrile, it's usually sharp and spiky and not too strong. Your spectra, you'll see it in your, some of your problems here. In the C13 NMR, the nitrile carbon atom is typically about 115 to 120 ppm. All right, any thoughts or questions on the spectroscopy of any of the carboxyl, uh, carboxylic acid family at this point? All right, 
So <clears throat> your textbook goes over a good deal of preparation of carboxylic acid groups. A lot of this ends up being review, but I think it's a nice point to review this. As I said earlier, carboxylic acids are in the highest oxidation you'll state. You'll see carbons when they're embedded in an organic molecule bound to another carbon. The only exception would be in the case of an isolated carbon, carbon of a carbonate or a carbamate group, which you'll maybe not, not see very much. So as I said, the carbon is in the plus three oxidation state. And just as a reminder, if you want to remember how you think about calculating oxidation state, you divide in your mind, you divide every atom out in the molecule, you basically envision the more electronegative atom getting the electrons if you have two carbon atoms bound together, they're equal electronegativity. So each carbon gets one, and then you compare that to the four electrons that the carbon should have. Or you can just say, oh, I know carboxylic acids are in the plus three oxidation state. So many reactions that generate carboxylic acids do so by an oxidation reaction. You can oxidize all sorts of primary alcohols. Primary alcohols have an oxidation state of negative one of the carbon. You can oxidize all sorts of primary alcohols to carboxylic acids. Chromium oxidation reagents are often popular. Chromium-6 in particular. Your textbook likes chromium trioxide, CrO3 in sulfuric acid. That's a, with some water. That's a great oxidizing reagent. Equivalent to that is potassium dichromate, K2Cr2O7. In fact, when you dissolve either of these in sulfuric acid, you get dichromic acid, you get the diacid, but they both end up having similar oxidation properties. This is probably the most useful and versatile way to generate the carboxylic acid group because alcohols are so ubiquitous. Your textbook also points out that all different benzylic carbon atoms, benzylic carbons are carbons that are right next to a benzene ring. All different benzylic carbon atoms can be oxidized by potassium permanganate if you heat the reaction up. Potassium permanganate wouldn't react with toluene at room temperature, but in the presence of some heating, you can chew up my informal way of saying oxidize, you can oxidize the methyl group to benzoic acid. I would describe this as a less useful reaction in the sense that it's probably not carried out that often in the laboratory. There are typically better ways to put a carboxylic acid group on a benzene ring. But I think your textbook points this out Manganese is in the plus seven oxidation state in potassium permanganate. It is a viciously strong oxidizing agent. In fact, if you go ahead and mix your potassium permanganate with sulfuric acid, you get uh, manganese seven oxide MN2O7, that's the green liquid that when it encounters any oxidizable material like paper bursts into flame. So manganese seven can be viciously strong as an oxidizing agent, can oxidize carbon-carbon bonds. If we subject say isopropyl benzene to the same conditions, we will oxidize the methyl groups off 
and end up with benzoic acid as well. Your textbook has a couple of nice problems of this, this sort as examples. So your textbook also reviews other reactions. One of the reactions they review is ozonolysis. of alkynes. This wouldn't be my favorite way to make a carboxylic acid. There are better, often better ways, but let's take as an example, diphenyl acetylene. So I'll just write pH, triple bond pH. Remember pH is a shorthand for a benzene ring. So that's, that's pH there, just a, a shorthand. If we treat it with ozone and water in the workup, we get benzoic acid, just the same molecule that I've written above, written in a slightly different, different way. Ozone is a gas. It's not a gas that you can store in a bottle or a tank. You generate it spontaneously. You generate it from ozone, from oxygen when you need it, passing the oxygen through uh, an electric field, basically where you have two high voltage electrodes separated and the electricity breaks apart and rearranges the O2 molecules to some O3. If you've ever used a slightly smelly photocopier or a slightly smelly printer, you may notice a little bit of a smell of ozone, this sort of sharp smell from the electric charges making ozone from the oxygen in the air. Because ozone oxidizes all sorts of double bonds, including the lipids in your lungs and other biological molecules, it's toxic. It's damaging. It's great when it's up in the high atmosphere, protecting us from ultraviolet light, but it's bad for your health. And these days, most uh, copiers and the like and printers try to minimize the amount of ozone generated to be safe. Another way of generating out of generating carboxylic acids is ozonolysis oops, of alkenes with an oxidative workup. If you take an alkene, and I'll deliberately choose a cyclic alkene so we can see one of several different reactions by which you can generate adipic acid, the molecule that we use to make nylon, to make one form of nylon. If we treat cyclohexene with ozone and then carry out a workup with hydrogen peroxide, and water, what's called an oxidative workup, we get adipic acid. If you haven't seen these conditions before or aren't comfortable with them because they're not in your current edition of the textbook, you could just say, all right, well, I learned an, an ozonolysis with dimethyl sulfide workup, a reductive workup, that would give us the dialdehyde. And then I could do a subsequent oxidation of the dialdehyde to the diacid by treatment with an oxidizing agent, such as a chromium-6 reagent, Cr2O3 and sulfuric acid and water or even silver oxide, Ag2O in ammonium hydroxide. So these are all versatile ways to form, to synthesize, to prepare carboxylic acids. 
The other case we learned in your textbook when we were talking about the reaction of organometallic reagents, your textbook talked about addition of organometallic reagents to carbon dioxide. So <clears throat> carbon dioxide is just another carbonyl compound, one in which you have two carbonyl groups on carbon. It reacts in many of the different ways, in many of the ways that carbonyl compounds react. So it shouldn't be too surprising that if we take a Grignard reagent, and I'll take a uh, P-methoxyphenyl magnesium bromide and we treat this first with carbon dioxide and second an acidic workup with, I'll write it as H3O plus, but again, as I've said, you can't go to the stock room and say, give me a bottle of H3O plus. They'll say, we don't have any. I can give you a bottle of HCl, hydrochloric acid in water, I can give you a bottle of sulfuric acid in water. So you would choose your source of H3O plus. But either way, you would end up getting the carboxylic acid. And I can tell you from personal experience, this is a very good way to synthesize carboxylic acids. You can bubble in CO2 into your Grignard reagent. You can go ahead and throw in dry ice into your Grignard reagent. Regardless, you'll get the carboxylic acid. If you throw in dry ice, you need to be careful because you can condense water on it and quench your Grignard. Although I haven't shown this, of course, if you're thinking about synthesis and saying, oh, how would we synthesize this molecule from say simpler compounds, maybe compounds containing six carbon or atoms or fewer, you could say, oh, I could start with phenol, benzene with an OH group. I could carry out a Williamson ether synthesis treating my phenol with sodium hydride to make the phenoxide anion. I could then alkylate with methyl iodide. I could then brominate at the para position with bromine and ferric bromide, and then treat with magnesium to make the Grignard reagent and immediately add CO2 and water uh, or an acid for the workup. So these are all of the sorts of levels of thought that go into thinking about stringing these powerful reactions together. Butyl lithium is another common, uh, common organometallic reagent. In fact, it's one that you can buy in a bottle. If you have excess butyl lithium and you want to get rid of it, you can just subject it to the same conditions and you will get pentanoic acid. When butyl lithium gets old because air gets in and you form peroxides and other sorts of byproducts or at least alkoxides, often you want to dispose of it. This is a safe way to dispose of it. So in all of these cases, the chemistry that's occurring is exactly the same as the chemistry we've learned with various uh, additions of Grignard reagents to other carbonyl compounds. In other words, you're just pushing, pushing your electrons like so. And generating your carboxylate cell. Thoughts or questions?
All right. If, if we think about carboxylic acids, and I had to say what was top of my charts for their reactivity, it would be embedded in the name. Carboxylic acids, first and foremost, are acids. In other words, they react with bases. Your textbook on this was a little puzzling. It described them as strong acids, which I definitely don't think they are. They're, they're what we typically learn, honestly, from freshman chemistry on as a characteristically weak acid. So carboxylic acid, like acetic acid, reacts with a base like hydroxide anion to give you the acetate anion. And water. This is just a standard Bronsted acid, Bronsted base reaction. I don't even bother writing an equilibrium here, although you could, because that equilibrium lies so far to the right. Hydroxide is a strong base. The carboxylic acid is a weak acid. And so that equilibrium lies very far to the right. Now, we can't go ahead, as I've said again and again, and go to, chem go to the stock room and say, give me a bottle of hydroxide, they'd say. Well, we don't have, we can't have just pure hydroxide, but I can give you sodium hydroxide, I can give you potassium hydroxide, I can give you lithium hydroxide, I can even give you magnesium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide. So you'd say, okay, please give me some sodium hydroxide. And then you would go ahead and take your sodium hydroxide, mix it with your acetic acid, presumably in some water, And you'd say, okay, now I have sodium acetate. All right, and that is probably the most important reaction of carboxylic acids. Your acetic acid, which I will now draw out, Like so, your acetic acid has a pKa. That's a measure of its acidity. That's a quotient of its dissociation in water. pKa of 4.76. It is a weak acid. By comparison, water has a pKa of 15.7. Now remember, when you're thinking about pKa's and you think about, well, how does that reflect on sodium hydroxide? You think about the conjugate acid. So the fact that water is a very weak acid says that sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So I would describe water as a weaker acid than sodium hydroxide. In fact, when I said, okay, why am I writing that, not even bothering to write an equilibrium? There is 11 pKa units difference between water and acetic acid. That difference in pKa units, roughly 11, that difference in pKa reflects the position of the equilibrium. I know when I look at this di difference in pKa that that equilibrium lies 10 orders of magnitude, 10 to the 11th to the right, which is why I'm not even bothering here to think of it as an equilibrium. If it was 
five orders of magnitude, maybe I'd start to say, okay, I'll write back and forth arrows. But it is a much weaker acid. And this is characteristic of all sorts of different compounds with a regular OH group. Like an alcohol has a pKa, depending on what numbers you use, of say 16 to 18, maybe 16 for ethanol, 17 for isopropanol, and 18 for tercutanol. So you look at this, you say, wait a second. Okay, what makes acetic acid so special? Why is acetic acid, although still not a strong acid, why is it so much a stronger acid than water? And you can look at this and say, okay, what's special about the acetic acid? And one way to look at this is to say, okay, consider the conjugate base. Let us consider the conjugate base of acetic acid. In the case of the conjugate base of acetic acid, I can write one resonance structure with the negative charge on one oxygen and a double bond to the other oxygen, but I can write an equally good resonance structure with the double bond to the other oxygen and the negative charge, you know, on with the double bond to the first oxygen, the negative charge on the second. And collectively, these two resonance structures make up a better picture of the acetate anion. In other words, resonance stabilization stabilizes the conjugate base And if we look at the corresponding alkoxide, or for that matter, hydroxide, you don't have that special resonance stabilization. And as a result, acetic acid is a stronger acid. Thoughts or questions? Stabilization of charge, stabilization of the conjugate base is a common and important theme in much of organic chemistry, stable, just as stabilization of positive charge is. In the case of the electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, we saw, for example, that when we carried out electrophilic aromatic substitution on, say, methoxybenzene, we saw that there was a special resonance structure that stabilized the positive charge, but allowed all of the atoms to have a complete octet. So methoxybenzene, electrophilic, Anisole undergoes electrophilic aromatic substitution far more rapidly than benzene does. And here we see acetic acid, we stabilize the negative charge and it is far more acidic than an alcohol. Another way of stabilizing negative charge is the inductive effect. The inductive effect also can stabilize the conjugate base.
One of the carboxylic acids we use frequently in my laboratory for the synthesis of peptides is the carboxylic acid trifluoroacetic acid, CF3CO2H or CF3COOH. It is not quite a strong acid, but it's pretty darn close. Usually a strong acid is defined as an acid that when you dissolve it in water, it's fully dissociated. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Sulfuric acid is a strong acid. The pK of the hydronium ion is negative 1.7. In the case of HCl or sulfuric acid, they are stronger than the hydronium ion, so they fully dissociate. In the case of trifluoroacetic acid, it's almost as strong an acid as the hydronium ion. Its pKa is 0.23. But you look at that and you compare that to acetic acid where the pKa is 4.76. Trifluoroacetic acid is four and a half orders of magnitude stronger acid than acetic acid. The difference is obviously the fluorines and what those fluorines are doing is they are stabilizing the negative charge of the carboxylate they don't stabilize it by resonance. I can't write any resonance structures that put the fluorines, uh, put negative charge on the fluorines, but each of those carbon fluorine bonds has a large bond dipole. As a result, the trifluoromethyl group is an electron withdrawing group. I'll say a strongly electron withdrawing group. And that results in inductive stabilization of the conjugate base. Inductive effects fall off with distance and decreasing electronegativity. And so if I compare this series, and I've just borrowed it from your textbook because it's a nice example. If you take a look at butanoic acid, its pKa is 4.84. If you put a two chloro group at that, we see the pKa is now 2.84. In other words, two orders of magnitude. <clears throat> Excuse me, up there, please. I keep hearing you while you're talking. So if you look at two chlorobutanoic acid, the pKa is 2.84. If you move the chlorine over, The pKa is 4.06 to 3 chlorobutanoic acid. And finally, if you move it over to the 4 position, now the pKa is 4.52. So, the way to think about this is the chlorine takes electrons away from the carbon that it's bonded to. That carbon pulls electrons away from the next carbon and so on and so forth as you move along the chain. But the further you go, the less effect it has. So if the chlorine's at the very end of the chain, it steals electrons from the adjacent carbon, which steals a little bit less electrons from the adjacent carbon, and so on and so forth, and only has a small effect on acidifying the carboxylic acid group, only 0.2 pK, 0.3 pKa units. But if the chlorine's nearer, then you have a bigger effect. We see the same types of effects when you have electron withdrawing groups on an aromatic ring. So if we look at benzoic acid, 
Benzoic acid has a pKa of 4.19. And if we compare it, so you notice a little bit less acidic than acetic acid. In other words, that benzene group by resonance is donating a little bit of electron density to the carbonyl group. So it's not as acidic, right? For, I'm, I'm sorry, I take that back, it's a little more acidic. So never mind. It is. Well, it is both electron withdrawing and electron donating, but by, by resonance actually it's, or by inductive, it's actually pulling a little bit of uh, electron density away. But the main comparison I want to make is with a para substituent. Let's take a look at para nitrobenzoic acid. So P nitrobenzoic acid, is a substantially stronger acid than benzoic acid. Its pKa is 3.41. In other words, it's more acidic. Than benzoic acid. So in order to think about this, we really need to think about the nitro group. We've seen in electrophilic aromatic substitution that the nitro group is a strongly electron withdrawing group. So one way you can just say is, okay, the nitro group has a dipole and that dipole pulls electron density away. That bond dipole pulls electron density away. But I don't think that's a fully complete way to appreciate the effects of the nitro substituent, or for that matter, the effects of other substituents, because the benzene is a conjugated system. And so if we consider the conjugate base of nitrobenzoic acid, and we look at the nitro group, and I'll go ahead and draw it out as one of the two resonance structures, two main resonance structures of the nitro group. And we now start to write some other resonance structures, and I'll just write one of them. one that should be familiar to us in our thinking of electrophilic aromatic substitution, or at least reasonably familiar to us. And I'll also write in parenthesis others, just to remind us this isn't the only resonance structure. If I look at this resonance structure, I say, okay, I can see that this resonance structure provides special extra stabilization of the negative charge of the carboxylate anion. Now, if I compare in the mix, if I compare paramethoxybenzoic acid and I look at its pKa, Its pKa is 4.46. In other words, it is less acidic, not only less acidic 
then p-nitrobenzoic acid, which has a pKa of 3.41, but also less acidic than benzoic acid that has a pKa of 4.19. And if we look at p-methoxybenzoic acid, and again, consider stabilization of the conjugate base in the same fashion, we see that now we get a special sort of destabilization. So again, I'm going to write at least one additional resonance structure. Again, I'll remind us that there are others. All right, but now what we see is that in this resonance structure where the methoxy group is pushing its electron density onto the ring, you'll see that this destabilizes the negative charge of the carboxylate. Yeah. Well, neither of these molecules other than the carboxylate has a net charge. So basically, although I've drawn formal charges in the nitrobenzoic at, uh, half of the molecule, this part of the molecule doesn't have charge, it just has formal charge. In other words, the net charge of the anion is negative one or the net charge of benzoic acid is zero. But the proximity of the two formal charges or at least the proximity of the positive charge to the negative charge in this special resonance structure is stabilizing, whereas the proximity of the negative charge to this negative charge in the methoxybenzoic acid is destabilizing. And the effects aren't huge, you notice. They're not as big as the difference between the resonance stabilization of acetate versus an alkoxide anion that might be 11 orders of magnitude or uh, versus hydroxide or 13 versus an alkoxide, but it's still a small but significant amount. Yes, so electron, well, yeah, they, tend to destabilize the carboxylate. In fact, they are, they are stabilizing it in the carboxylic acid form in the sense it doesn't want to give up its, its proton. If we were to write a, an energy diagram, you'd say it is essentially more downhill to give up a proton with say a base like hydroxide more downhill to give up the proton of nitrobenzoic acid than it is to give up the proton of p-methoxybenzoic acid. Other questions, great questions. Ah, wonderful. Meta and ortho groups inductively have a similar effect, not quite as large. So metanitrobenzoic acids, pKa is, is metanitrobenzoic acid is not quite as strong an acid as 
nitrobenzoic acid. They're both weak acids, but remember they're strong compared to benzoic acid. So meta nitrobenzoic acid is stronger than benzoic acid, but less strong than nitrobenzoic acid. And the phenoxy, the methoxy is kind of the same, same effect. It's not as big an effect. Other questions? So there's sort of two reasons we're learning this here. So one of the reasons we're learning this at this point is it's helping to reinforce these con concepts of resonance, stabilization of charge, and all of the effects that are important in organic chemistry. And at the sophomore level, that's a big effect. When I teach the junior level course, the Chem 125 course, I bring in another set of concepts called linear free energy relationships, where people have understood the structures of molecules that you can't see, like carbocations that you can't put in a bottle, reactive intermediates and even transition states, through substituent effects like this. So when I say, for example, that a reaction goes SN1 or SN2, one of the ways that people have, start, have understood these differences, when you can't see a transition state for an SN2 reaction or a carbocation in an SN1 reaction is to look at effects like the effect of the methoxy group or the nitrobenz or the paranitro group on rates of reaction. So a little bit harder to understand. All right, I want to talk additionally about resonance. As I said, it's a very big concept. And so your textbook in part to reinforce this concept does so with phenol and specifically the resonance stabilization of the anion. So phenol is substantially more acidic than a regular alcohol. It's about seven orders of magnitude. The pKa of phenol is 10. The pKa of say cyclohexanol is uh, 17. I'll say about 17. What's special about phenol is, again, the stabilization of the negative charge. We can write a variety of different resonance structures, minor resonance structures, that spread that negative charge around and thus stabilize it. And it's the exact same concept that we saw in electrophilic aromatic substitution. In fact, it's the same concept we saw in the stabilization of the positive charge that I just alluded to in electrophilic aromatic substitution of say methoxy benzoic acid. So being able to write these types of resonance structures and more importantly, think these types of resonance structures really goes ahead and helps our understanding of the stabilization of negative charge. So I'll call all of these, I'll say collectively, they make up a complete set of resonance structures, but these here are what I would call minor resonance structures. and they help stabilize the negative charge. And they make the phenol more acidic. And just for comparison and to finish us off, I'll show paranitrophenol. Paranitrophenol has a pKa of 7.1. So it is three orders of magnitude 
more acidic than phenol. And we can write all of these resonance structures here, but I'm just going to write two to finish us off to show that special stabilization. I'll write this resonance structure showing all of my lone pairs of electrons and charges and bonds. And then I will write one additional resonance structure, just a select resonance structure that really epitomizes that special stabilization provided by the nitro group. And if you're astute here, you'll realize that the effects that we're looking at in phenol are way, way bigger than the effects that we're looking at in benzoic acid. In other words, in phenol, we're seeing effects that are ranging many orders of magnitude for special stabilization. Whereas in the case of benzoic acid, we were looking at one pKa unit, not 10 versus 17 or 10 versus seven, but we were looking at ranges from three to, to the fours. And the difference is that the phenol OH is the phenol oxygen is directly conjugated with the benzene ring, whereas the carboxyl group of benzoic acid is cross-conjugated. We can't write any resonance structures that directly push that paramethoxy uh, acid lone pair or that nitro group positive charge onto that carbon of the carboxyl group. And so that's one of the differences. All right, on this note, I will close today's class I wish you tremendous success on your midterm exam. As I promised, about half of the midterm content is adapted from textbook problems. So all of your hard work on the homework and keeping up with all of those problems will be rewarded on the midterm exam. I wish you tremendously well and look forward to seeing you on Thursday.